Hello and thank you for joining us. You're listening to a WeDo Talk with David Jakes. Hi, welcome to this week's WeDo Talk. Today I have a great guest joining me from the fine city of Chicago here in the US. I have Mike Morawski. So Mike, a very good morning to you. Welcome to WeDo. Thanks so much for joining us. David, that's a big statement, the fine city of Chicago. <laughs> well, I usually like to give people some kind of recognition for the city they live in, and uh, Chicago has some, some great stuff going for it. So you're a native of Chicago, I think. I am. I've, I've lived in uh, Chicago my whole life, or in the area, you know, the suburbs. So as means of introduction, uh, Mike is joining me today to talk about a number of things, uh, his story and a lot of the things that he's done. Uh, currently, Mike is the founder of an organization called My Core Intentions, which is an educational organization focused on helping people pursue and realize their goals as real estate investors, real estate underwriting, real estate lending, borrowing. And uh, that's something that Mike has done himself for quite a number of years. Uh, he's a veteran real estate investor himself and also has worked in the area of property management and prior to that was in the construction industry. So uh, buildings and real estate and property has been in his life for most of his life. Now, in the financial crash of 2008, uh, many people, many organizations that were involved in real estate investment lost a lot. Uh, Mike was no exception of that, but he lost a lot more than just money. So Mike, if uh, I could ask you to start off with a little bit of a background on uh, where you grew up, how you grew up, what life was like in your early days in Chicago, and what got you into the world of construction and real estate? All great questions, that's for sure, David. And again, thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it and uh, um, always love to share and hope that uh, I can make an impact in, in just one person's life today as a result of, of my story, because I think I bring you know that, that level of success and, and loss and, and redemption. Um, like you said, you know, I've been in real estate 30 years, but um, I don't come from a background of being a family of entrepreneurs. So I don't know where I got it. I can remember I was working for a guy uh, in the swimming pool business. And you got you can only imagine in the Midwest in the wintertime being in the swimming pool business. It's not it's not a best business in the world. But I worked for this guy and I can remember saying to myself, I think I could do better than him. I, I really believe that I could run a business, do more business and, and have a more productive business than this guy. And that was my first venture into becoming an entrepreneur. I was in my early 20s and went into business for myself. And other than a couple of six month stints working for somebody just to make some cash flow, I never looked back. I say I actually say today I'm unemployable because I, you know, uh, have worked for myself for so long. I, you know, have my own thought process that doesn't work a lot of time for other employers. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's sometimes hard when you've been doing something very independently to be able to go back and be an employee and have a boss and be at somebody's beck and call. So um, yeah, I, I completely understand that. And for many of the freelance people that I speak to, that's usually a recurring theme of, I, I really enjoy being in control of my own destiny and my own life and my flexibility and my schedule. So, so more power to you. Well, here's the other point to that too, is I don't know where the real estate bug came from. I, I, you know, I, there's a couple stories I could tell you, but, but one that's really prevalent is, is, you know, I'm eight years old, we're on family vacation, I'm sitting on the side of a swimming pool with my dad, and we're at this resort. And I clearly remember asking him about all the rooms around the swimming pool outside. And, and he doesn't know anything about real estate, but here's what he says. He says, people come and they stay here, and they pay the owner money. And it was something that clicked in me at that point. I said, I want to be the owner. I want people that are going to pay me money. And, and it was just something I always kind of held on to. And that's really, I think, what kind of got my interest in real estate was that early conversation like that. Yeah. So did you ever play Monopoly as a kid and then uh, kind of get the feeling of this is how I could make money out of it? I did. I played Monopoly. <laughs> I uh, yeah. It's kind of what I teach people today is buy four houses, cash it in, buy a hotel, buy four hotels, cash it in. 
it, it, there's a lot you can learn off of the Monopoly board and there's, there's many versions. I've got the London one, which I kind of uh, very fond of myself. Mm. Um, so then you did get into the world of, of real estate investing and how, how did that happen for you when, when you first kind of got into that? What did you do to get into that environment? You know, I, I left that, that swimming pool company. I went into my own swimming pool business and I learned very quickly that you couldn't keep guys busy all year long. I said, well, what can I do? Uh, this is the creative side of me. I said, what can I do to build a business that I have guys working all year long and I don't have to go through this rehiring and retraining phase every year? And so I said, well, let me start doing kitchen and bath remodeling. Kitchen and bath remodeling led to room additions, then some commercial work. Now I build this animal that I'm still doing all the sales, all the marketing, all the contracts, all the buying, all the scheduling, and I'm still banging nails in the field and burn out. And I tell my wife at the time, I wake up one morning and I just go, I can't do this anymore. So fortunately, I had somebody who was knocking at the door trying to buy the company and I sold the business took a year off. And during that year, um, her and I house hacked a couple of houses. This is long before it was sexy to do. Now everybody does it. But I house hacked a couple of houses where we were living in these properties, rehabbing them and met a real estate agent along the way. And this guy uh, was really good at what he did. And I went to him and I said, hey, um, you know, I'm thinking about going in the business. And he said, I think you'd be really good at it. So he encouraged me to go in the business. So, you know, I listened to, I heard Jim Rohn years ago say, you know, success leaves clues. And if you do what other successful people do, you can ultimately be successful yourself. So I went to him and asked if I could shadow him. And he said, no, I'm going to do better. I'm going to make you a cassette tape. Now I'm dating myself, but um, so he made me this cassette tape and I listened to it over and over and over again and went into the real estate business. My first uh, nine months in the business, I sold 78 single family houses. Um, I was Remax Rookie of the Year that year. And then I went on to build a team selling 125 homes a year and did that consecutively for about 10 years. So that's how I got in the real estate space. So that was in sales, and I can see that you've got some some skills and some background in the sales environment. But then getting into real estate investment, that must have been a whole different animal altogether and, and raising capital to, to make major investments. Yeah, great question. So in 2005, I saw the market starting to shift and soften, and I knew I was going to have to do something else. And, and I'm a hero. I don't want to have to lay people off. I want to keep people busy. So... I had like seven people working for me in the real estate business and I knew that I'd have to go do something different. So what I did was I always wanted to be in the apartment syndication business. And you know, I understood the simple metrics around that, right? You find a real estate deal, you go to family and friends and people, you know, outside that circle of influence to raise private capital. You marry the private capital with the real estate, you stay in the middle and as long as everything goes well, you make money. Well, I, in 2005, I syndicated my first apartment deal. And then I went on uh, to, to raise $18 million and buy $60 million worth of real estate. That was 4,000 apartments in five markets. And I did that in 30 months. So I grew way too fast, really fast, very mm -hmm. unstable. But I also built a property management company at the same time, managing 7,500 units. And from the, you know, I built this company it was almost a hundred million dollars in value. And like I said, I grew way too fast, made a couple other mistakes along the way. Well, you know, we learn from our mistakes. Um, hopefully early on, you are able to capitalize on things that went wrong and and be able to do better, but um, you, you you were obviously riding that wave of a of, of very robust, very hot market up until that point. And I don't think anybody or very, very few people in this world were actually able to predict what was going to happen in, in 2008. So when the financial crash started unwinding, where were you at at that point and, and what was the immediate impact on you? Yeah, it was devastating. Um, it I remember having lunch with my CFO. Um, I had built this company. 
uh, hundred over hundred employees. We we had we were in five markets around the U.S. and you know um, hundred million dollars in value. And I had you know four thousand apartments in the midst of all of this. My CFO and I are at lunch and we're watching on TV. The news happened to be on, and we're watching people walk boxes out of Lehman Brothers by the dozens. I mean, not just one or two people, but the news is like fascinated. All these Lehman Brothers is turning upside down, going out of business. You know, AIG is going out of business. But but I looked across the table at lunch and I said, we're screwed, aren't we? He goes, yeah, we're in big trouble. And um, mm. I didn't know the impact of that statement at that point, but I knew that there was going to be some ramifications and I just wasn't sure what they were going to be. So here's what happened. Um my company, because it grew so fast, very unstable. And I started having people move out of properties, couldn't pay the bills, net operating income dropped. And um, uh, as a result of that, I couldn't pay my bills, nor could I pay my investors. So what I started to do was move money from profitable companies to non-profitable companies. My accountant, and my attorney both said, it's okay to do that, just leave a paper trail I did. I left a paper trail, but what I didn't do was I didn't disclose to my investors the movement of money back and forth. So as a result of moving money back and forth between companies, I wound up being charged on wire fraud and mail fraud charges and sentenced to 10 years in federal prison back in 2013. Wow. That that must have been something that you never envisioned for yourself and uh and, and you didn't deliberately go out to defraud people i mean that clearly wasn't your intent so do you feel that you were very much a, a victim of the system at that point a little bit but let me be clear i did break the law and and i you know i, I didn't disclose to my investors and non-disclosure is a big thing transparency is a very big thing uh, if you're syndicating deals, if you're, you know, when we take someone else's money, if David, if you gave me $5 today and you wired that money to me, I'm held at a very high standard, regardless of the dollar amount. I'm looked at differently by you, by people around me, by the government, that um, I have to have a, a different respect for that. And um, I I think people need to be aware of that. To to play this money game is not just an easy easy thing to do. You have to really make sure that that yeah. you're taking care of other people. So um, I made these mistakes, and what I always tell people is, "Hey, look, I never flew private. I didn't buy a big house. I didn't have a boat. I didn't, um, I, you know, I, I didn't live a fancy lifestyle." Um, I was the neighborhood baseball coach. I had a great marriage. My wife and I were best friends. And all of a sudden I got ripped from that to live in a 12 by 12 room with three men I didn't know, nor did I like. And wondering what the hell happened in my life. So, um, yeah. So um, before we move on to that, were you able to salvage any of the financial assets and, and anything from your business or did you pretty much lose everything? Yeah, we lost everything. We turned everything over to a receiver. So all the assets got turned over to a receiver. Hmm. Uh, all that mean, That's just a fancy name for really doing a voluntary bankruptcy, but we didn't go bankrupt. So we never bankrupted the company. Um, we, we we gave the all the assets to a receiver to run the assets thinking that that would quiet the investor noise and help things a little bit, Be, having a third party operate everything, but it really didn't help. So after all of that, suddenly over a, a relatively short period of time, you find yourself in federal prison. How, how did you deal with, with that? I mean, suddenly, you know, you're incarcerated with, with people that are criminals. I mean, how, how was that for you? It must have been a very difficult thing to be able to accept and be able to manage. And I can't imagine the feelings of maybe anger and frustration at the system yourself or whatever. How, 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 was, how was that for you? Yeah, so here's a couple of key points, right? I want, um, you know, listeners to really understand, um, you know, I said this earlier, success leaves clues. Whether that's good or bad success, it leaves clues. Learn from my mistakes. And, and I think that I made a few mistakes. Um, 
and, and I'll talk about those in a minute, but, but the other thing is defining moments. We all have these defining moments in our life. But one of the defining moments that I had was I'm in prison about three weeks and um, all of a sudden my wife decides she's going to divorce me. And when that happened, it wrecked me. Um, I didn't know how I was going to get through today, much less 10 years of a prison sentence. I'm with, at the time, 900 men that I didn't know, didn't want to know, uh, didn't want to be involved with. Thank God for a couple of guys that came up next to me and said, hey, you're, you're going to be all right. You're going to get through this. Because the joke was, let's take his shoelaces because we think he's going to hurt himself, right? Huh. So I'd been in prison about six weeks. And, you know, I kind of gone from this middle class lifestyle. I was a marathon runner uh, to, to being 35 pounds overweight, hating myself. And I'm, I walk in the gym one day. And I always pre-qualify this statement. I tell people, look, I was just window shopping. I wasn't looking to buy anything at this point. And I walk in the gym and this guy walks over to me, young kid, about 25 years younger than me, 20 years younger than me. And he says, hey, look, don't let these people beat you. All they want to do is take everything from you you've ever known. They can take your real estate. They can take your business. They can take your money. They can even destroy your family. But what they can't take is who you are and what you're made of. They can't take what helped you build that $100 million company. They can't take what helped you build that construction company. That came from inside. That's who you are. That's your DNA. He said, you can get this 10 years back. He said, start coming to my class every day. Start working out. You'll start losing weight. You'll start feeling better. David, I don't know what it was, but it was that defining moment. I went, man, unbelievable. And I, I said, okay, I'm going to take you up on it. So I started going to the gym. I started losing weight. I started to feel better. And then all of a sudden, I go to college. I get a bachelor's degree in theology. David, I wrote two books. One is Exit Plan, which I'd love to give your listeners a copy at the end of the show. Um, but that's on multifamily investing. And then there's one I wrote on property management. And then I wrote an ethics course that I taught real estate investing, property management and ethics in prison for six years. How ironic, you know, a, a federal inmate teaching ethics. And yeah. I met a professor uh, from the University of Minnesota because I was on an outreach program, went into the community. I told my story like 40 times to local businesses and small business owners. He and I co-authored a paper together that we had published in the Business Journal of Ethics that today gets taught at the collegiate level for forensic accounting and sales and marketing classes. Now, if anybody wants a copy of that, they could they could grab it off my website. But, um, you know, I, I made that decision to do something different with my life. I had choices. I could have laid down. I could have done nothing. I could have just went to sleep and called it a day. But. I decided I was going to use that bad thing in my life to help other people. Yeah, that, that's amazing you're able to do that. And I can imagine that my guess is you're probably the exception that really wanted to turn your life into something positive after that very difficult experience. And, and many people probably don't. So uh, great kudos to you for doing that. So, um, so you were sentenced to 10 years. Were you in prison for 10 years? Uh, no, I was um, I was in for just under eight, about se about seven years and ten months, and then I came home. Mm -hmm. In the federal system, you do about eighty five percent of your time, which would have been about eight and a half years. But then I got um, some time off for another program that I took in prison, which uh, there's only one of those types of programs. It's a inpatient or a, a residential criminal based behavioral program. And then there was some home confinement time. So that got me home about seven years and 10 months. So I came home the week they closed the world down for the pandemic. So I oh. went from one prison to another. But you know what's interesting is so many people in our lives, David, walk around in a prison themselves. They're in this mental place where they may have had loss in their life. Somebody may have died, a broken relationship, addictions to, to sex, drugs, you know, uh, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, we're trapped in our own mental prisons that, you know, you don't have to stay there. You know, one of the biggest things I see with people is that they don't forgive others. 
And, and if you don't forgive somebody, you, you stay trapped in this place that isn't good for you or that other person. And the starting point of that is forgiving yourself. Yeah. Right. I mean, we all do things that we regret. We all, whether they're major things, whether they're minor things, everybody has some kind of experience of you've done something wrong, you've made a mistake in your life. And, and it's important to be able to leave that behind you, forgive yourself for that, forgive aggressors against you. It's something I've learned a lot about recently. And, and, and then just start to look to the future and not get caught back in that mud that you might be stuck in. Um, so it's interesting, Mike, when you said you went home, did you actually have a home to go to? I didn't. Let me back up a little bit and, and make all these changes and do all these things. I come home from prison. I'm in the halfway house. But I have a friend that I met before I went into prison who stayed in touch with me while I was gone. And we built a relationship and he and his wife let me come to their house for about three months. And I went to their house, kind of got on my feet. But, you know, it, it's been an interesting journey, right? That you, when you come out of prison, you know, you have choices that you have to make. And you don't know how to mitigate that time. It's hard to mitigate that time. Um, funny story. In prison, you have... Uh, there's commissary. That's where you go and you buy your, you know, some food and snacks and, and, you know, your hygiene. So for hygiene, there's two kinds of shampoo in prison. There's the kind the white guys use and then the kind that the, the guys with curly hair use, right? And I say that comically because the choice in prison is easy. If you're a white guy, you choose the white guy shampoo. If you're African American or, or, you know, Mexican, you choose the other one, right? It, it's a simple choice. But when you come home and you go to Walmart and there's 45 choices of shampoo, you go, oh my God, how do I mitigate this? So, yeah. so you know, I'm actually involved in a ministry at church today that um, helps guys that come home because that's a transition. That's a big transition for people. So, And, uh, you know, it's what you say is 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 very interesting that you did have somebody that was there for you because um, the three areas of help that I look at for you know somebody trying to reassimilate themselves back into uh, a quote unquote normal life and and this I think also goes for um, people that come out of the military as well mm. um, that the assimilation back into everyday life can be difficult in some of these choices that you haven't had recently and the three areas that i look at are friends family and public assistance they're really the only three groups that you have so the fact that you had your your good friend and his wife that were able to welcome you into their home um you know that must have been a, a, a great start but my question for you is that when when you come out and you've got this criminal record it must be really difficult to get a job so did you did you try to find employment or was that entrepreneurial spirit so ingrained in you that you really wanted to go and try and build something else? Yeah. So while I was in prison, you know, I wrote those books. I wrote a couple home study courses. I wrote a business plan. I knew that I was going to come home and, and I've been self-employed since I was 23 years old. I, I knew I was going to come home and do my own thing. And, and my philosophy is, you know, um, that I, I want to give back. I want to help other people. And I do that through my story and through, you know, my material and things that I've learned over the years. But, you know, first of all, I'm back in the coaching and training business. I teach people how to invest and sell and in real estate, in multifamily real estate, how to manage. You know, um, I, I just recently got approved by the SEC to go back and be an issuer again of deals. So I'm back doing, you know, I, I work with my coaching clients. I get down in the trenches and help them build a business and roll my sleeves up and partner with them in deals. I've partnered with a coaching client and gone back in the property management business. So there's things that I'm doing that are, you know, bringing me back full circle back into life. So, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things you said, mentioned earlier on, which um, I have to come back to because it's something that's really important for me, is is being a marathon runner. Because so am I. I've I've run a number of marathons in my life. Is is that something that's back in your life again? No, my knees are shot. But thanks for asking. Oh. Anyhow. <laughs> 
because once a marathon runner, it's always kind of a part of you. I think you're, it's always. You're right. I miss it too. You know, I, I miss that competitive. I, I hurt a knee bad um, my second year in prison. You know, I came home in the best shape of my life I'd ever been in physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. So um, okay. I, I, and, and I continue to try and maintain all those spokes in my life. Um, physically, I'm, you know, I'm in the gym four to five days a week. Um, I do cardio four to five days a week when the weather's nice in this great city of Chicago, as you so elegantly put it, um, I go out, I do a lot of walking, a lot of bike riding. I love to be on the lakefront. So, yeah, yeah, it is beautiful there. Yeah. So, well, well, great that you're able to, to do that and, uh, very cliche, I know, but healthy body, healthy mind, they really are connected and, my own journey with mental illness myself, one of the things which I really feel has kept me stable has been the distance running because when I'm focused on that, it makes me focus on something which is very positive and something I just feel good about. And it helps me be a better person. It helps me be more supportive and helpful to my family, it helps me be a, a better person to my clients and, and helps me all around. So, so that is really great if you can do that. Yeah. Um, so Mike, here you look back on, on what you've been through and the strength that you've built from those experiences, even though these are experiences you would not have chosen for yourself. What advice would you give to anybody who's finding themselves in one of these very challenging positions, either you know facing criminal charges or the, the victim of circumstance where you just kind of feel, I'm at the end of the road? What what type of advice would you give somebody to be able to get through it? It's a really great question. You know, I've, I've told my story a number of times. Um, and um, I've had people call me and say, you don't know the impact that your story had on me. I was in a situation where I had to make a decision or a choice and I was going to go one way. And after listening to you, I decided to go a different way. Um, I think things that I would tell people is, is live with total integrity um, and don't veer from it. You know, um, ethics is, is an interesting space and we can, we, we can make a choice to act ethically, behave ethically um, or not. And if, and just because you act unethically doesn't mean you'll break the law, but enough unethical actions will cause you to break the law because it gets easier and easier. Um, so I always tell people, get somebody to be accountable to. Um, if I could have changed anything in my life, I would have pressed into my coach more. Um, I didn't have a coach during the last couple of years of, of my business uh, faltering and failing. And I think if I would have kept my coach, that that wouldn't have happened because my coach and, and, you know, listen, we can have a coach in our life, but we got to talk to him. Right. Or talk to her. And we have to entrust in her and help them to understand where we're at and what's going on so that they can give us good advice. Um, and, and why I like coaching so much is it's a, my coach never told me what to do, but they helped me self discover what I already knew I needed to do. Um, so, you know, my advice for people is be accountable to others, have a coach in your life somebody that you can go to confide in that will help your business grow and listen to the challenges that you might have along the way as well. Yeah. And another piece of advice I always give people is surround yourself with people who are positive and people who are supportive. And it's all too easy to fall into that trap of being surrounded by people, whether they're work colleagues, even family members that that are not supportive and don't have that level of positivity. And certainly in the workplace, uh, you know, I've worked independently now for about 15 years myself, but for the most of my career, I was an employee. And, and I remember how I go from a situation of having this great job and then a couple of years down the road, I think to myself, wait a minute, I don't like it here anymore. I used to like these people and now I don't like them. What has changed? Yeah. Is it the company that's changed? Is it the people that have changed? Or is it me that's changed? Or is it a little bit of everything? So I think that that level of self-awareness of always thinking 
Where am I at in relation to the people I'm with? Who am I surrounding myself with? Who are the people that have my back and are in my court? And if you don't have those positive people, it's really important to try and find them. And I would say that obviously people engage you now professionally for your skills for real estate investment and, and the knowledge that you can impart to them. But they probably do see you very much as that coach and mentor. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. So, Mike, this has been great. Thanks so much for sharing your story. And I'm, I'm sure we could go into a lot more detail um, and we could take a lot longer. But uh, if anybody would like to reach you or would like to read one of your books, what's the best way of reaching you? How can they research you and find out more about you? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. Uh, first of all, wherever you get your social media fix, I'm probably there, uh, whether it's Mike Morowski or whether it's my core intentions. Um, I am on every platform, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and then uh, of course my YouTube channel at my core intentions where there's all kinds of ton, you know, content and data that you can grab, grab a hold of. Um, if you wanna grab a copy of Exit Plan, your complete guide to multifamily investing and why you need an exit plan before you buy. And I wrote that because Everybody always teaches us how to get in a deal. Nobody teaches us how to get out. And I wanted people to know how to get out, how to maximize their profit. But you can go to my website, which is mycoreintentions.com forward slash exit plan. And actually, um, I have a new link. If you go to mycoreintentions.com forward slash free, um, there will be three things there that you could could take advantage of my book exit plan uh an ebook on multifamily investing and then an ebook on passive real estate investing so if you're somebody who likes real estate but you don't want to get your hands dirty you can passively invest and this is a great ebook to teach you how to do that or what to look for and then i love the network so email me at mike at my core intentions and i'll be more than happy to book a call with you and get on and see how I can add value to your world. Great. And is this your purpose in life right now? Is this what you see yourself doing for the foreseeable future or maybe 10, 20 years from now, there's, there's something different going on? You know what? I'll be honest with you. God's working on me lately. And um, the real estate investing and coaching and training business will be something that I'll continue to do. I have putting together some home study courses and some, you know, some recorded things that people will be able to access. Um, but I'm also, I mentioned to the prison ministry. So um, I'm really starting to get more involved in that and I'm not sure exactly where that'll go, but it's headed somewhere. So, Well, Mike, I wish you every success with, with everything you touch going forward. And I, I know you've been through a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily have envisioned for yourself, but um, I hope they made you stronger and that you'll just go from strength to strength and uh, and you'll have many more successes. Thank you, David. I appreciate being on and I hope your listeners all gleam something from it. I'm sure they will. Yeah, well, thanks again for participating today and thank you everybody for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel, leave your comments below. Uh, you can also go to the WeDo website at getwedo.today where you can reserve your username and you'll be on the list for notification of the product launch. So thanks again for joining us and I'll be back soon. We upload a WeDo talk every week. So if you enjoyed this one, please subscribe and leave your comments below.